Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 19, Remastered. This is the first episode in the fourth series, where I'll be introducing you to the amazing and revolutionary field of evolution. In the first series, I introduced the basics of biology and all of the major groups of biomolecules. In the second series, I took a step back and examined all of this biochemistry at the level of the cell. In the third series, I looked at genes and how they get expressed like instruments in a grand symphony, all working together to develop, grow, and sustain an individual organism. Now in this series, I'll be taking one more step back by looking at populations of individuals and how their genes and alleles are slowly changed through time by the processes of evolution. Following this trend, the next series after this one we'll cover in detail the evolutionary history of all life on Earth. Now, I'm really excited about this series, and I'm really excited about the next one, too, because evolution is just, it's such a fascinating topic. I love learning about it and reading about it and uh, learning about new stuff, new discoveries, like unearthed fossils or uncovered genetic secrets. I'm extra fascinated with the story of human evolution, particularly with how we developed such a large brain in such a relatively short period of time. But that's a topic for another episode. Today, I'm introducing evolution as a scientific theory. And make no mistake, the theory of evolution is rock solid. For those who are listening with a background in science, or who are currently being educated in a scientific field, you're no doubt familiar with the concepts of hypothesis and theory as they're defined in a scientific context. A hypothesis is like an educated guess that's based on your observations of some kind of phenomenon. A hypothesis is what you test with an experiment. Your experiment will either refute your hypothesis, or it will offer data that, as far as you can tell with your instruments and your tools, supports your hypothesis. Now, as you test your hypotheses with various experiments, you begin to accumulate data. And as you begin to accumulate data, after you've conducted experiment after experiment after experiment, and after you've uh, conducted observations in the field or you've looked at fossils, you know, after you've done all this stuff over and over and over again, you start noticing trends or patterns, and you begin to get a better idea of the bigger picture. If these experiments and observations and discoveries continue to pile up and accumulate, eventually you'll get a really good idea of what's going on. When you have enough data from testing all of your hypotheses, you can then formulate them all together. You can compile them together to make a theory. A scientific theory is an explanation for a given phenomenon, which takes all of the data that's been accumulated over years of research and incorporates it together into a single coherent entity, into a single coherent theory. Isaac Newton's calculations on falling and moving objects eventually led to the theory of gravity. Conversations between Matthias Schleiden and Theodore Schwann led to the cell theory. And the independent work of Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace led to the theory of evolution by natural selection. Long before Darwin and Wallace ever lived, people would look at the great diversity of life and wonder how it all came to be. The Greek philosopher Plato thought that every different species had a perfect essence that defined them. The rabbit essence defines the rabbit. The birch tree essence defines the birch tree, and so on and so forth. Plato believed that the essence of each species was unchanging and immortal, fixed into their particular type or kind. Aristotle ran with this typological thinking and expanded upon it, building the so-called Great Chain of Being, which ranks species according to their size and their complexity. According to the Great Chain of Being, inanimate matter like rocks and dirt and ocean water was at the very bottom. Then, above this, were the lower plants, like simple ferns and shrubs. And then you had the higher plants, like flowers and large trees. And above them were the invertebrates, and above the invertebrates were the egg-bearing vertebrates. And above these were the vertebrates who give birth to live young. And at the very top of this great chain of being sits the human being. 
In the great chain, the human is the ultimate organism. The human is the ideal, its perfection. Everything below the human is lesser in quality, increasingly so as one descends the ladder into ferns and, uh, and then the soil. And everything on this chain, including humans, is unchanging in its essence and in its form. Aristotle's idea, this so-called great chain of being, was basically the default position for almost 2,000 years. But in the early 19th century, the French scientist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck came up with the first major reformation to this idea of the, of the great chain of being. Working from the great chain of being as a basic premise, Lamarck argued that the essence of a species could change, by gaining complexity and moving up the ladder, so to speak, or moving up the chain. Without a very sophisticated knowledge of the technical details, Lamarck hypothesized that organisms evolve greater size and complexity through a process called inheritance of acquired characteristics. This basically argues that individuals will respond to their environment in some way so as to give them a certain characteristic, which is then passed on to their offspring. A classic example that you'll find in textbooks and in most educational videos is that of the giraffe. The Lamarckian view is that the giraffe has to stretch out its neck to reach its food, and this stretching literally elongates the neck. The long neck is passed on to the giraffe's offspring as an acquired characteristic. Another example is that of a bodybuilder. According to Lamarck's hypothesis, the bodybuilder has acquired enormous muscle mass, and this size would then be passed on to his child as the child's default state of being. Now this might sound a little silly. Because it is. Lamarck himself gave up on his hypothesis of the inheritance of acquired characteristics as Darwin and Wallace were formulating their own ideas about evolution via natural selection. Now both Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace both argued that the great chain of being was flawed. Instead, Darwin argued for descent with modification, positing that species in the past are the literal ancestors of the species alive today, and the morphological differences that we see between the ancestor and the descendant are due to gradual changes that take place over immense periods of time. Coincidentally, the study of geology was also maturing around this time, around the early 19th century, and the consensus in the field of geology was that the Earth couldn't be 6,000 or 10,000 years old, uh, which was the, the predominant religious view at the time. Geologists found that this couldn't be true by a long shot. These early geologists reasoned that the Earth had to be millions of years old, maybe more, in order for things like sedimentary rocks to be able to form. The development of radiometric dating, which analyzes the ratio of isotopes in a rock to determine its age, allowed scientists to determine hard numbers with regards to the age of the Earth. As I'll discuss in greater detail in the next series, the Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago. Life appeared really quickly after the crust cooled, some 3.6 billion years ago, maybe more. It was across this 3.6 billion year long time period, beginning with the genesis of the first cells and ending in the modern day. And over this time period, the processes of evolution have sculpted various life forms into all the wild diversity of life that we see around us today. And what's even more mind boggling is that of this 3.6 billion years, approximately 3 billion of those years were just Single-celled organisms, slowly accumulating mutations, slowly evolving, not changing a whole lot. But about 600 million years ago, in the, uh, in the eon leading up to the Cambrian explosion, things really started to get crazy. You had multicellularity emerge, and then you had all these different animal lineages emerge, you know, these mobile organisms that could move around and scavenge for food. And then things really took off. I mean, once you had this, uh, this plastic-based biological form, that could be adapted to fit into any kind of niche or habitat, I mean, it would. It, life just took off and evolution really accelerated as you started to have all of these populations move in and diversify and specialize, and the whole thing got going. It's beautiful. It's this beautiful evolutionary dance, and it began 3.6 billion years ago.
Okay, so a lot of scientific fields were maturing during the 19th century. Geology was becoming much more refined, biology was becoming much more refined with the theory of evolution, and a blend between them, paleontology, began to pick up speed as a formal discipline. People had been finding fossils for centuries, but all of this fossil data wasn't really organized or compiled into a, into a coherent field of study until a man named George Cuvey published his work on comparative anatomy in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, as these early paleontologists dug into the earth, they would find all of these various fossilized remains. By putting the full skeletons back together, they would yield a creature with unmistakable similarities to modern life, to modern animals and plants. It quickly became apparent that many fossils in a given region resembled the animals that were living there today. Darwin argued that this was evidence of the fossilized species being the ancestors of the currently living species. As time went on, more and more fossils were found, and our understanding of our evolutionary past became a little clearer, piece by piece. As researchers looked between various depths in the rock layers, they noticed that similarly shaped fossils could be used to connect related species, and to explain their ancestry. The fossils began to tell a story through their transitional features, through features that gradually changed or disappeared over millions of years in response to some kind of evolutionary pressure. A famous example of this is the study of the limbs of the first fish species that gradually acclimated to dry land. 385 million years ago, a species of fish possessed fins protruding from meaty little lobes that came off of their sides. These limbs were little more than fleshy stubs that ended in fins, you know, just little stumps with a few simple bones that could articulate the fin, but these lobes could also be used like a very primitive foot to push against the ground and to flop in a particular direction. Over time, those fish with the best articulation were able to move the fastest the most efficiently, and they were able to get the most available food that existed in their muddy coastal habitat. Within 10 million years, the bones in the fish's lobes had split apart into smaller pieces, allowing it a greater degree of articulation. At this point, the fish species can't really even be called a fish anymore, as they spend more time on land than they do in the water. At this point, they're four-footed amphibious creatures, they're the first true tetrapods. Within another 10 million years, the small bones in the tetrapod foot had evolved to align and radiate outwards in the shape of primitive toes, no longer clumped together in a lobe or a fin shape. It only took another 3 million years for the tetrapod hand to evolve an obvious chirality, with longer fingers in the middle of the hand and shorter fingers on the edges. Not all of the evidence for evolution comes from fossils. A great deal of data can be found in organisms that are alive today. One of the first things that evolution could explain were vestigial traits, or traits that are kept in the organism but ultimately serve no useful function. These vestigial traits are proof of evolution because they demonstrate that species can change through time. What was once a trait heavily used by an ancestor species is now little more than a peripheral growth or an unused feature in the modern species. Humans have several vestigial features that served a purpose in our ancestors, but is reduced or non-functional in our bodies today. For example, when we're cold, we get goosebumps, which causes our hair to get raised up. In the rest of the apes, and in other monkeys and primates and other mammals that have thick coats of hair, this reaction where they're cold and they get goosebumps and this raises up the hair would help the animal stay warm. By lifting up the hair, you create a layer of warm air between the skin and the hair itself. And this layer of warm air helps to insulate the primate, or the mammal, and keep it warm. Humans don't really have a, a thick enough mat of hair for the goosebumps to really do anything. We can lift up like the hair on our arms, 
but the hair just isn't dense enough to be able to trap in that layer of warm, of warm air. We can't trap in that heat. We haven't lost the ability to get goosebumps in the first place, and so for now, that remains a vestigial feature. Now, another example. Humans also have a literal tailbone, called a coccyx, which sits at the very end of your spine on the back of your pelvis. In our monkey cousins, the tail is a prehensile appendage that helps them swing from tree branch to tree branch. The common ancestor of all apes lost this tail, and so all members of the ape family don't have a tail, not just us humans. Uh, you look at chimps and bonobos and orangutans and gorillas, and none of these organisms, none of these primates have tails. The coccyx is all that remains of this ancestral tail, and in our modern forms, it's little more than a humble protrusion of bone, two or three centimeters long. What's really fascinating, though, is that during our gestation period, when the human embryo is developing in the womb, the embryo possesses a tail for about four weeks. This tail is built, and then it's broken down as part of a series of highly conserved and coordinated gene expressions that ultimately creates a healthy human baby. Vestigial organs exist in many other species across the animal kingdom, across the entire kingdom of life. For example, you have eyes, or eye sockets, that exist in blind, cave-dwelling fish. You also have finger bones that exist in the flippers of whales. There's also pelvis bones in the lower abdomen of snakes, and then you have the wings of every single species of flightless bird. By the time Darwin's theory of evolution had been spread throughout the world, it was obvious that the initial idea of species being this unchanging thing was false. That became obvious. Species could be easily shown to change over time, connecting living species with their extinct ancestors to form evolutionary lineages. Not only do species change through time, argued Darwin, but species can also change through space, through geography. This disproved another idea of the great chain of being, namely that every species was created and exists independently of other species. You see, this is because as a population of individuals migrates across a landscape, they will tend to separate themselves from other populations of their species by geographic distance. If this distance is great enough, or if the physical geographic barriers between the populations are insurmountable, like a huge impassable river or a massive impassable mountain range, then these separated populations will not interbreed. If they don't interbreed for a long enough period of time, that is, if the two populations are isolated from one another for, for a long enough period of time, they'll begin to genetically diverge into separate species. The most famous example of this is taken straight from Darwin's observations from his world-renowned voyages on the HMS Beagle. Darwin cataloged a huge number of species from the Galapagos Islands, most famously the mockingbirds and finches. He noticed that these finches were all very similar, but they had particular differences depending on the island that they lived on. Darwin reasoned that at one point in the past, a single ancestor species had migrated out from the continental mainland to the Galapagos Islands. This ancestor species either settled all of the islands in a similar time period, or they settled the islands one by one. But the net result, as Darwin saw it, was the same. This ancestral species produced descendants, and these descendants showed descent with modification, as each population of finches changed to fit into the environment of its particular home island. For example, you had islands that had thicker, heavier seeds, and these had finches that had short, powerful beaks, because these short, thick beaks were ideal for breaking open these thicker, heavier seeds and then eating the nutritious flesh inside. Any birds that had a smaller beak would be at a disadvantage on such an island, as they would be outcompeted for food, uh, they, they would struggle to crack open these shells, and they would be outcompeted for food, and they would eventually starve to death. Now, on islands with smaller seeds, or with seeds that required very fine, dexterous manipulation to acquire, like to pull them out of the plant or something, these finches developed longer, thinner beaks. These beaks were strong enough to eat the seeds, 
but they weren't so large so as to hinder the manipulation and the acquisition of the seeds. Subsequent genetic study of the finch genomes on the Galapagos Islands have validated Darwin's claims. The Galapagos finches came as a single ancestor population to the islands, and then they spread out to all of the islands, and once they were separated like this, they slowly evolved to better fit into their particular island environment. And so you have all of these different subpopulations all diverging and speciating along their own evolutionary trajectories. Okay, I want to shift gears for a moment and refer back to when I was talking about the evolution of the forelimb, how uh, these early lobe fin fish evolved jointed limbs and then chiral hands. The evolution of the tetrapod arm is really interesting. Because when you look at this huge arrangement of lineages, you've got amphibians, and reptiles, and birds, and mammals, they're all very different lineages of these major groups in the, uh, in the kingdom Animalia. And yet, when you look at their forelimbs, you see that they all have the same analogous bone structures in the same, you know, proportions. For birds, they have the same finger bones, they're just spread out across the wing to support the, the wing. Reptiles have uh, somewhat squatter, heavier bones that supports them as they hold themselves up closer to the ground. This similarity in the traits between related species is called a homology. A homologous trait is a trait that's shared between two species that they both got from their common ancestor. Homologies can exist on a genetic level, they can exist during development, or they can be part of the animal's mature physiology. A genetic homologue is like a gene in a common ancestor that got passed down to all of its descendants, or at least uh, to the two related descendants that you're looking at, that you're comparing. And this passed down gene would keep the same general sequence and coding for a protein that serves the same general function. A developmental homologue is something that exists in an embryo during development. I already mentioned how human embryos grow a tail for a few weeks during gestation, and this is a developmental homologue to the tails developed in other mammal species, which generally share the same conserved set of genes. For example, uh, a human, a cat, and a fish embryo all produce tails and gill pouches. In humans, both the tail and the gill pouches dissolve during development. In cats, the gill pouches will dissolve, but the tail will remain, and eventually grow into a larger structure that eventually becomes the cat's fully formed, fuzzy tail. In fish, the tail structure is reshaped, and the gill pouches develop into functional gills. This suggests that most animals contain the genes for gills and tails, as well as other genes that are involved in the initial development of the animal. Because these genes are so fundamental to the healthy growth of the embryo, the genes are tightly conserved through time. Any mutations to the genes are almost always going to be deleterious, as they'll interfere with a carefully balanced chemical orchestra that is embryonic development. This takes me to structural homologies, which are fundamental similarities in body design between species. One of my textbooks has a quote from Darwin on this that's absolutely perfect. On structural homologies, Darwin says, quote, what could be more curious than that the hand of a man, formed for grasping, that of a mole, for digging, the leg of a horse, the paddle of a porpoise, the wing of the bat, should all be constructed on the same pattern, and should include the same bones in the same relative positions? Unquote. Indeed, if you were to look at all of these animals, you would see that they all have four limbs, all with the same general bone structure. The major differences are really in the size and the orientation of the bones, but their fundamental structure in the limb is the exact same. The turtle, the human, the horse, and the bird all have a single humerus in the upper arm, a radius and an ulna in the forearm, a clump of carpal bones in the wrist, a set of metacarpals, and two sets of phalanges, or fingers. In birds, these phalanges, or the, these finger bones, form the structure of the wing. This speaks volumes about the fundamental interrelatedness of all life. Try to see how all three types of homologies can interact with one another. 
genetic homologies get expressed and manifested into the developmental homologies of the embryo, which in turn will develop into the structural homologies of the mature, independent organism. Okay, so let me briefly recap what I've covered so far. The fossil record showed that species can change through time, and that living species are connected through evolutionary lineages to extinct species that came before them. The Galapagos finches are a perfect example of how species can change through time and space, again demonstrating a lineage by descent with modification. The relatedness of species across evolutionary time has created similarities, or homologies, between species that exist on a genetic, embryonic, and morphological level. All of this data validates the theory of evolution. But what really seals the deal and makes the theory of evolution absolutely watertight is the massive amount of internal consistency. Across all of biology, and even across other fields like paleontology, geology, and chemistry, all of the data coalesces beautifully in support of the theory of evolution. There's another really good example in one of my textbooks that demonstrates the explanatory and predictive power of this kind of internal consistency that's so valuable to the, to the theory of evolution. The example that my textbook gives is about the evolution of whales and dolphins. Paleontologists identified a group of organisms by their fossils. Specifically, they identified them by a unique set of ear bones that belongs only to this group, which is called the cetaceans, and it includes all modern-day whales and dolphins. Of all the cetacean fossils, some have long, fish-like skeletons suited for an aquatic environment, while others have more compact bodies with larger limbs meant for walking on dry land. By lining up the cetacean fossils according to the age of the sedimentary rock that they were found in, from oldest to youngest, very distinct trends become obvious. Radioactive dating provides absolute ages to the fossils that corresponds to the relative ages between the fossils. Geneticists created phylogenies of whales and dolphins and then analyzed the genes of a lot of their nearest living relatives, and they found that the nearest relative to the cetaceans is the shallow water-dwelling hippopotamus. So right there, you can see how there was this evolutionary lineage of terrestrial mammals that slowly adjusted back into an aquatic lifestyle. Furthermore, many species of whale have vestigial hip bones, and many dolphins express vestigial hind limb buds in the embryonic stage of their development, which, in other animals, would develop into legs. So all of this data from geology to paleontology to taxonomy to genetics, all provides an internally consistent data set that strongly suggests that whales and dolphins evolved from a land-dwelling ancestor over 50 million years. It's really important to understand that evolution is not proved or demonstrated with a single fact, or a single case study, or a single point of data. The reality of evolution was only made evident through an overwhelming preponderance of data, slowly accumulated over generations of study and experimentation. Darwin broke the theory of evolution down into four points. First, that individuals within a population have variation in their traits. Some individuals are faster, others are stronger, some have slightly darker fur, others have a less noticeable body odor, and so on and so forth. All of the traits that all of these animals have, there's variation between individuals within a population. Second, these variations in the traits are heritable. This is to say that tall parents will generally have tall offspring. Plants with broad leaves will generally have offspring with broad leaves. A field mouse with brown fur will tend to have offspring with brown fur, and so on and so forth. Third, Darwin reasoned that more individuals are born than can possibly survive. More individuals are born than the environment can reasonably supply. This inherent overpopulation will create scarcity and competition. The individuals within a population will compete for food and other resources, and as a result, some will win and some will lose. Some organisms will get to eat and reproduce, and others will die before they get the chance. 
Fourth, and finally, this winning and losing, this difference in reproductive success, is based on the variation in traits seen between individuals. As some individuals are faster than others, they might be better able to evade predators. As a result, they are more likely to survive and reproduce. The subsequent generation of individuals will have a higher proportion of the alleles for high speed, as those individuals who were too slow to outrun the predator were mostly killed before they could reproduce. This process is called natural selection, which I'll briefly cover right now, but I'll talk about it in much greater detail in the next episode. The phrase natural selection is quite literal. The environment, or nature, selects who lives and who dies. This isn't to say that nature deliberately chooses individuals. Instead, natural selection is a passive process. Nature simply provides the stimulus, whether it be a geographic obstacle, an environmental pressure, or a predatory threat. If the individual organism cannot escape these problems, it will die. But if it can survive these problems to eventually reproduce, then it can be said to have been selected. The outside environment isn't the only thing that can create problems for an organism. If an individual can't compete with other individuals in its own population, it'll die out. The finch, whose beak is too small and weak to open the thick, heavy seeds, will starve to death, while nature will select the finch that has a thicker, more powerful beak, because they have a relatively easier time cracking open these seeds. The field mouse, whose coat of fur is a dull white, will stand out in a grassy field and be quickly killed by a predator, while nature will select the mouse with a dark coat because of its ability to hide, because of its capacity for camouflage. The monkey that has poor depth perception will fail to grasp onto a branch and will fall to his death, while nature will select the monkey with good depth perception to live on and breed. In all of these ways and more, all of the dangers and the threats and the pressures posed by nature act kind of like a great filter, or a great selection process for choosing those individuals who will survive and reproduce and create offspring that will persist into the future, and those individuals who won't be so lucky. Of those few who do survive to reproduce, they will pass on their genes, they'll pass on their alleles down to the next generation. The ones who die won't get this opportunity, and their alleles will be snuffed out. They won't be passed on into the future. To put all of this very simply, Darwin's theory of evolution basically posited that heritable variation leads to differences in reproductive success. The more fit you are, the more you fit into your particular environment, into your habitat, the higher your fitness. The more likely you are to survive and reproduce, and thus pass on your alleles into future generations. So what does it mean to say that an organism is fit, or that an organism has a high fitness? This doesn't necessarily mean that the organism is literally physically fit, with lots of lean muscle mass and a low body fat. No, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Fitness, in a biological, evolutionary context, means the capacity of an individual to survive the rigors of nature and reproduce. An organism that has a high fitness in one environment may have a low fitness in a different environment. For example, elephants have a decent fitness for the African plains, but they have a very poor fitness for the Alaskan mountains. The fitness of a particular species can change as it migrates from biome to biome. Fitness can also differ among individuals within a population. Because of the variation in traits between individuals, those that are better adapted are generally more fit, and they're able to have more offspring than those who are less fit, or less well adapted. Okay, so now this raises a question. What is an adaptation? An adaptation is a heritable trait that increases the fitness of the individual, and allows it to successfully produce more offspring than those individuals who don't have the adaptation or than those individuals who have kind of a weaker form of the adaptation. Now this can be kind of a confusing point, so let me clarify the difference between an adaptation and Lamarckian evolution. 
Remember that Lamarck argued for acquired characteristics. That is, that environmental pressures will induce qualities onto individual organisms, which are then passed on. Again, the textbook example of this is the giraffe. As the individual stretches to eat food, his neck stretches or extends. This is not how it works, as natural processes cannot induce deliberately beneficial mutations like that. Just because you're stretching to raise your neck out doesn't mean your neck is going to get longer. Instead, natural selection works more like a filter. The weak or the unfit are culled. They're unable or unlikely to reproduce given their low fitness, and eventually their alleles and their traits are weeded out of the gene pool. Those individuals with high fitness will reproduce, and their alleles will go on to the next generation. Over time, alleles that are associated with a high fitness will exist in a higher proportion in the population. While alleles that are associated with a lower fitness, uh, they, they've tended to die out, and so they will exist at smaller and smaller proportions in the population as time goes on. So this brings me to an adaptation. An adaptation is a gradual development over many generations, where those least fit individuals and their alleles are bumped out of the gene pool, leaving only those alleles most suited to a given habitat. This should also differentiate adaptation from acclimatization. When you move to live somewhere that's a lot hotter or colder than where you came from, you might find yourself uncomfortable in this new weather, in this new climate. Over time, you'll get more and more used to it until it seems normal and you're comfortable in that new climate. Essentially, you've been acclimatized to the weather in the new area. This has nothing to do with evolution as the process of acclimatization doesn't alter your DNA. It doesn't change your alleles or the heritability of those alleles. Only mutations can change alleles, and only through natural selection and long periods of time can those few beneficial mutations be preserved and eventually be spread throughout an entire population. It's really important to understand that mutations do not occur in a Lamarckian fashion. They don't occur in response to a particular stimulus. Mutations are not deliberate, and they can't be planned for. Mutations are just one of those things that just happens. And you can't really know when or exactly where the mutation will happen until it's already happened and affected a gene somewhere. In the vast majority of cases, any given mutation will impair some gene. It'll impair a protein, or it'll interrupt a regulatory sequence, and the organism will suffer some kind of developmental or biochemical abnormality. In this vast majority of cases, the mutation is deleterious. It's not beneficial, and it just hurts the organism. So in, in most of these cases, these deleterious mutations will lead to the organism uh, either being a stillborn, or not living very long into adolescence, or not being able to keep itself alive into maturity very long. Um, all sorts of things can possibly happen, where these mutations will just make the animal, or the, or the plant, or whatever organism it is, these mutations will just make it weaker, more sickly, and less fit. Now sometimes, the mutation doesn't affect the individual's fitness, for better or for worse. It's just a neutral mutation that doesn't really do anything, kind of like a silent mutation. But these neutral mutations, I, I guess they're kind of common, but they're a lot less common than the negative mutations. Deleterious mutations are really common, because biology is just so finely tuned, so that when you come in and mutate something, and you turn a, a knob this way or that way, chances are you're just going to wreck something. You're not going to improve the organism. However, in very, very rare cases, mutations can offer some kind of advantage, like a slightly more effective version of an original protein, or perhaps a more efficient chemical pathway. These beneficial mutations, even though they're very rare, they offer a bonus to the individual's fitness, making them more likely to survive and reproduce. For example, uh, if you have a protein that gets mutated and now it's more effective at doing whatever it does, well, because you have this internal biochemical efficiency upgrade, you are now more fit. You can use resources, that you can use the nutrients you consume more efficiently, and your body is that much healthier. When an individual organism experiences a beneficial mutation, uh, their allele, their mutated allele, is more likely to be passed on to the next generation. 
This will repeat generation after generation, with the less fit dying off, and the most fit surviving and reproducing, until eventually the allele with the beneficial mutation has spread out to a large portion of the population. In this way, evolution is not a deliberate, goal-seeking process. Evolution simply takes what works and runs with it. It's the biological equivalent of throwing everything you have against the wall to see what sticks and going with that. And whatever sticks, you'll keep going with until it stops sticking. This is a metaphor for how species can diverge and radiate and speciate, and how some of those species can hit dead ends and go extinct, while others may survive for a while longer before going extinct on their own. And uh, keep in mind that every species will eventually go extinct. The lineage of life may keep perpetuating itself and meandering here and there and speciating and diverging, but every individual species only exists for a brief period of time before it either goes extinct or transitions evolutionarily into another species. Perhaps as a final death blow to the great chain of being, evolution has shown that organisms do not belong to any kind of hierarchy based on complexity or perceived superiority. Evolution can make complex traits simple, and it can make simple traits complex. It all depends on the species in question, it depends on the evolutionary pressures that are acting on them, and it depends on the base alleles, the base biomolecules, and morphology that's available for evolution to work with. Alright, that was a huge amount of information, and I feel like I talked for a long time, but I barely got started. I feel like I barely scratched the surface of evolution. But I guess that's okay, because there's another five episodes in this series where I can explore all of this stuff in greater detail. As for this episode, I hope you learned something cool about evolution from a, a very general perspective, and I hope this episode was able to get you interested enough to maybe do a little more research on your own. There are literally thousands of awesome examples of evolution in action that you can go and read about, or you can just wait and tune in to the next episode where I'll be discussing the mechanisms of natural selection in greater detail, as well as numerous examples of how natural selection has affected species all across our planet. If any of that sounds cool, then be sure to come by and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening.